for the salvation that you have purchased for us at such tremendous price. We thank you that we still enjoy liberty in this country to assemble and to study your word unmolested. We thank you that you are commissioned the four angels to continue to hold back the four winds of strife while you are doing the work of sanctifying your church and trying the, to bring them into the, a more fuller representation of your character. Bless Amen. us as we Amen. study today. We pray that your spirit will continue to abide in this room and to prick and convict us to make decisions to come up higher. Let us be mindful of the sacred teacher as we've asked it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This is, um, we'll have, I'm going to go quickly. <clears throat> we have a lot of slides to cover. Do you want his robe and all that it represents? This lady said, if I can just touch it. And that robe, I believe Jesus wore white. And I believe that she was not trying to just touch material. She was trying to get hold to something by faith that that robe represented. There's, you know, it's kind of interesting. The soldiers also wanted his garments, but for a different reason entirely. They didn't even understand what his garments represented. Um, the Bible says that they parted his garments amongst them. And it's interesting to me that, that those garments that they parted, that the way that they decided was through chance. Mm -hmm. Who would get what? There's people in the church today that they're trying to get Christ's righteousness. They're trying to get that robe, but the way that they're doing it is the, whole, is the wrong way of doing it. Um, You've got to have purpose and decision and planning in order to get this, this robe. It's interesting, the Bible says that um, this is in John chapter 19 that the soldiers when they had crucified he just took his garments and how many different garments did he have? It's kind of interesting. There were four or at least they were divided into four parts and it says I think nothing is in the Bible by accident when it describes his coat it says it was without seam. It's like it's just one continuous garment without any seam together and when it was Weave together, it was, what does it say here? Woven. Woven from the top. I think that's heaven's way of saying that uh, Jesus' garment was, it was from heaven. That, that, but that, what it represented is something that it comes from the top when he puts it, when he puts it on you. It's interesting, the Zyre, I took the statement out in the Zyre of Ages. It says that they got these garments without interference from his enemies or his friends, even his followers. They didn't, they didn't really value those, that core man. They're like, go ahead, take it. And I think today, many people in the church don't value the garment of his righteousness. Mm -hmm. But before this is all said and done, we're going to want to have this on us. Our study is on three texts in the Bible um, that mention the phrase white <coughs> raiment. The title of the sermon I call White Raiment for You. Righteousness by faith, why are so many Christians still naked? Here's the first text. It says, Him that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in... Sister, this is, this is hammering them already. It's, it's right there. You're not going to get that unless there's some overcoming. And it says, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father. He'll take those prayers, and he will carry them for me forward before his father. The, let's talk a little bit about the importance of this robe of righteousness. Inspiration says, what's the first two words? Urge, Urge, them. Urge them to give attention to securing, what's the words in red The richest, the richest gift. gift that can be given to mortal man. We should be urging people, you need to get the richest gift, which is the robe of Christ's righteousness. Paul talked about it in um, Philippians, he said, he showed, he showed it was so valuable, he says, I count everything, all things, what does it say? Lost, but lost 
for the excellency of the this what he called it one phrase, the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but you know, he said, I count it like waste if I can just have this one thing. If I may win Christ and be found in him, it's another way of saying it. Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. What was he wanting to, to give everything up for and count it done for? The righteousness which is of God by faith, which is connected to a phrase he says, that I may know him. It's, it's when he starts to live his life in you. It's when you really come to know him. And Paul, was it valuable to him? Amen. He said he counted everything else lost and counted it as waste that he could win Christ and have this role. Another powerful statement that shows us important in Gospel Workers, page 301. It says, this I do know, that our churches are going to say they're in pain. Dying. Dying for once of teaching on the subject of righteousness by faith. Our churches are dying. You know, we have these SAP school lessons that we that every fifth, sixth, seventh year, you might have one that touches on it. You know, I've always thought, that, you know, if you have an army, it doesn't make sense to have all of the, every soldier in the army only looking in one direction. You know, if you're going to go into a battle, you need to be, soldiers need to be looking in all directions. We need to be studying what the Spirit convicts us we need to be studying. And the Sabbath school lesson, unfortunately, it's just one page per day. And on Friday, it's not even a whole page, friends. That's not a very serious Bible study. Mm -hmm. We've got to go way beyond three little paragraphs a day and patting ourselves on the back that we've studied. We're not going to get it that way. Our churches are dying for lack of this teaching. I'm going to say at the bottom in pink. And on what? <laughs> we're dying not only for the lack of righteousness by faith, but because they're not studying other subjects that are related to that. What are other kindred to truths? Amen. Studying character development in the Bible, the life and teachings of Christ, um, how to get the Holy Spirit in the early reign and latter reign, the, uh, the seal of God, the sanctuary messages like God's Ph.D. thesis on righteousness by faith. Peter's letter, Ephesians 6, and of course, the latest singing message, which I'll touch on just briefly. You know, um, we know that in the seven churches, that geographically speaking, they were found on an imperial post road of Rome. This was an actual road. It still exists today. They still can see the stones of this road. And I want you to notice that, that the first three cities, you're traveling north. But when you get to Pergamum, it's all south from there. You're coming down. You're coming down. It's interesting that the biggest distance was going from Smyrna to Pergamon and then going from Philadelphia to Laodicea. That's where the greatest um, spread. spread took place in the conditions of these churches. You know that these literal cities represented seven different churches. And the last one was what? And Laodicea uh, means... Uh, people that are judged, uh, people that are receiving justice. It's right now that Jesus in heaven is um, bringing judgment on the church of, um, from the beginning, from Adam's generation. He's coming forward. He's going to actually come up to the, to the cases of those that are alive, the judgment of the living. And it's during this period of time uh, of the Laodicean church that, that while the church is being judged, that um, we are living in now. We're living in that period of time now. That's what the name Laodicea means, but what was the condition? The spiritual condition of this lukewarm. church. It was the lukewarm church. What does that mean? Wishy-washy. Okay, they just got kind of like a half-way experience. You know, some, some of them are, they're religious, but they're also very secular. They, they do some good, but they're also doing some bad. It's like a, they, their diet is good, but they don't exercise. Oh, they exercise, but they diet not good. They, they're, they're hot in some areas of their life. In other areas, it's icy cold. But they have a form of religion. And friends, the whole world is full of churches in this condition. What was the true witness prescription for them? What three things did he say would solve that problem? Go time to fire. What else? Come on. 
Yeah. White robe of righteousness. What else did he tell them they need to buy? Have. They had to have some ice have. You know, we are a faithless people. That gold is faith that works by what? Yeah. Kind of hardcore on some people. But we are faithless people. You know, any kind of difficulty, we start, we sing the song of murmur. We don't praise God. We should embrace difficulties. When trials come, we just say, God got an answer. God got a plan. We should be talking faith. But, we, but because we, we complain when every trial comes, it shows that we're lacking this goal. Where does this goal come through? What is it? What is it? What is it? It has to come through some difficult things. We also need heavenly ISAB. Watch this. This is Manuscript Release Volume 10. It says, put your whole being into the Lord's hands to be moved by what? To be controlled by his, infused by his. Then the eyes of your understanding will be anointed with the heavenly ISAB. You will not have ISAB till you surrender. And what happens, how does that work? God starts talking to you while you're laying in your bed about your sins. He starts saying, you know what, you've got a smart mouth. You know, you're, you exaggerate. Your truth, your speech is not accurate. He starts, starts revealing things about you. You say, Lord, take that away from me. Take it away. When you start putting your whole being in his hand, then God's going to start to open up your vision to start seeing things, to show you how to reach these people around you that you have been unable to make any impression on. He starts to give you this heavenly I said, matter of fact, the conditions of Laodicea, um, when Jesus gave that message as the true witness, he actually spoke about things that were, um, that the people in that literal city understood. That city was actually famous for a famous I said. And when the, the third part of that counsel he gave was to buy of him, what was it? White rain. That thou mayest be clothed. That's what our subject is on today. It's this white raiment, and you don't get it for free. It says you have to purchase it. You got to pay a little something to put this on. Uh, in the book, um, Letters and uh, Epistles of the Seven Churches by Taylor Bunch, he says that Laodicea, that city was noted for what? Black, black cloth. cloth. Black cloth. Man, in fact, there, the wool was glossy and black, of soft texture, almost like silk. It became famous throughout the whole region. It says black garments were almost what? Universally, Universally worn. My lady scenes and of them, they were what? Yeah. These people, they were they dressed in black all the time. They were famous for these black garments. And Jesus told them that they needed to buy of him white raiment. People of Lady Sea, this is the Seven Princes of Christ by Taylor Bunch. People of Lady Sea were familiar with the what color? White. Worn by the Romans, who the Romans said was a symbol of victory. But to the Christians, that white toga represented purity of character. And they, some of the latest scenes despise Rome. They despise it, but Jesus said, you know what you need? You need white raiment. You need to get out of this black and put on white raiment. That was kind of a startling message to the people in that region because they were so proud of their black garments. You know, today there are people that dress in black. They put black makeup on. They dye their hair black. That's, um, they call them goth. And uh, it's an obvious casting off of traditions. It's, uh, it's saying, hey, I don't need all the colors of the rainbow. Black is what I, this is what I'm different from you. They're, they're just saying, they're, it's a way of saying rebellion. But you know what? The, there, are, there are other black spiritual garments. It's the way that people mm. dress, it's actually revealing their spiritual condition. And it's showing that spiritually that they're disconnected from God. People that wear skin-tight clothes got to have every bangle and jewelry on. People that they're dressing in a way to say, you know, I don't care what the world says, but it's, it's another way of saying that we're living in a world today of people wearing spiritually black garments. And, and what, what does God call our righteousness? Filthy. You know, that word um, for um, filthy, that Hebrew word means, it comes from a root word that means periodical. It means something that comes cyclically. It's that your filthy rags, they're not, they're not always black. Sometimes they brighten and it looks like you're doing pretty good. Then they come black again. It's like, it's like you're, you're inconsistent in the way that you live. It also means menstrual flux. It's something that has a stench to it, that it stinks in the eyes of God. And, and that text says, their righteousness is as filthy, not righteousness is, is as filthy rags. And it says, we all do to say they're in green. Fairly. You know, if you, 
if you look at a leaf, it, it starts out green. You know, as the winter comes, it goes <coughs> back to its original true color. And, it, it, and, and sinners, what happens is that as conditions get difficult, their real color comes out. They mm -hmm. start to, the red starts to show through, okay? It's, not, it's, green, it's green when everything's going well. They're fair weather Christians, but when things get really difficult, that irritation comes in their voice. And, they, and it says, their iniquities, what does it say here? Like, like the wind. You know, this text is saying that the sinner, that their life is, they're controlled by circumstances. It's like a leaf tumbling in the wind. It can't decide which way it goes. The wind determines which way it goes. And people that are unconnected to Christ, whatever circumstance comes in their life, it drives them. And it goes all over the place. And then it goes on to talk about the solution. It says, there's none that call upon God. There's none that does what? Do what? Yeah. If you want to get rid of those robes of, right, of, of, of unrighteousness, those filthy rags, you're going to have to stir yourself up in order for you to get that robe of his righteousness. Why has this subject disappeared off the horizon of the church? Why aren't we studying it? Why aren't we hearing more about it? Why aren't we dwelling on it continuously? And where did it, where is the origin of it? Did God teach this early in the history of humanity? We'll try to answer some of those questions and talk a little bit about this battle. Originally, Adam and Eve were not naked. They were clothed in garments of light. God gave them, he was told, uh, three spiritual gifts, page 34. The sinless pair wore no artificial garments. They were clothed with a covering of what? Light. Light and glory, such as the angels wear. And of course, we know when they sinned, they lost that garment. And then they immediately tried to create their own garments. It says, the Bible said that they sewed together what kind of leaves? It's kind of interesting. Fig leaves look like hands. And they just try to stitch those together and make their own garments. But the Bible calls those garments as aprons. They made something that didn't cover all of their skin. They said, we just want to cover just the sensitive parts. And when God looked at they lost their robe of light. They were naked. They saw each other differently. God said, I've got to, look, what they made is not satisfactory. He prepared for them what's called, what, God and Adam? Unto Adam and to his wife did the Lord God make what? Coats. In that word coats, in the Hebrew, it means to cover. That means that what he made for them, it completely covered them. It wasn't just a little fig leaf apron. Now, they actually were covered. And something had to die for them to be covered. And it shows that early in human history, the garments were actually God's way of teaching them about how he wanted to put his righteous life upon them. Often the illustrators of children's Bible story books take liberty to reinterpret the Bible description. I call this the caveman dress. Okay, you'll see it in all of these different books. That is not what um, the coat that covers look like. Um, um, I call this giving an iconographic, that means a spirit uh, symbolically, where the picture is a symbol. It's a nod to evolution, yeah. and it's a subtle introduction of you, what I call unisex fur minis. I'm going to back up this, this picture because you see that the woman and the men are wearing the same thing, and they have one shoulder out, their legs out, and, um, it's, um, and, and this is, who is this? Okay. And who is this? That's the wicked and the righteous. And you notice that both the wicked and the righteous are wearing the same garment. You know, the message of this picture for a child is confusing, and it's, it's erroneous, and it's, it's error. And we shouldn't put it before them. Over the centuries, God was teaching his people about living the life of the Messiah <coughs> through um, the, um, the, the vehicle of the tabernacle service. All of these pillars represent members of the church. They were all covered in a white linen that represents Christ, the garment of his righteousness. It was the same white linen that the priests wore. The priests wore a white linen robe, and God intended that each pillar in the church would have, be covered 
with the white linen robe. When you were coming from the outside, you couldn't see the pillar. It was just the white linen. That's all you saw. Its only purpose was to uphold that white linen for the world to see. And the sanctuary service is going to tell them how they can get wrapped in that robe of Christ's righteousness that the priests had. But we know that Israel forsook the commandments of God. They rebelled. They became disobedient. They became idol worshipers. And the truth of this doctrine of righteousness by faith was lost to them. We know that their city was destroyed and that they were taken in their vessels captive by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon. And there they received, they drank and they imbibed um, false teachings of paganism. And the truth of how to be clothed in Christ's righteousness was lost to the Jewish nation, so much that there was four centuries of darkness. God couldn't even send a prophet to these people for 400 years. So finally Jesus came, <clears throat> and through his life and through his teachings, which are largely in the book of Matthew, he taught them how to receive his righteousness. Some of his, par some of his parables are giving special keys of how we can have that righteous life. Um, one of them was John 15, the vine and the branches. And it's interesting. He says, he that, what's that word? Abideth. Abideth in me, and I in him. Saying brings much, much, much food. And he says that those that don't abide eventually, it says that men will come for them. Men will come and gather. Men are taking the minds of our children nowadays. They go to these public schools. By the time they come out of those schools, men have already gathered them and prepared them to, to burn. What is the purpose of that parable? He says, listen, You've got to stay connected if you want to um, produce the fruit that um, I want. To, if you want that love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, you must abide. And that abiding must lead to what? Fruit-bearing. It must lead to fruit-bearing. What was the other big lesson in that story? It says fruit-bearing is increased by what? Mm-hmm. Listen, if you want to bear fruit, I'm going to send trials into your life. I'm going to bring some hard, a little hardship, a little pain for you. Because it says that, that the branch that beareth, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth what? More fruit. If you want more fruit, if you're praying for fruit, you're going to have some fiery experiences. By the way, pruning is always more drastic than you think it needs to be. This is an actual pruning of, this is, this is grapes in particular, is what Jesus was talking about. This is how it looks in the spring, this is how it looks in the summer. The winter pruning takes it down to this. That's the first year. That's like, it's like man, you sure cut off a lot. Doesn't look like this. Look at the second year. The second year is this big. And when it's properly pruned in the winter, look what it's taking down to. Same here, third year. Big fruit, cut back severely. If you, what is that saying? God, that's what Jesus is saying. Say, look, you want more fruit? I gotta cut deep. I gotta cut deep. If I don't, you're gonna have too much growth and the fruit will be small. I got it. I was pruning our cherry tree. And when he said, What are you doing? You're killing the tree. I'm like, hey, We have to cut that tree. I actually pruned a little bit too much. I'm like, hey, well, We're gonna fix this thing. I gotta have some big cherries next year. But when God prunes, he cuts deep. So, Jesus was giving parables. He's teaching righteousness by faith. He said, I'm going to teach you some principles here. Embrace these and you're going to bear much fruit. Another powerful story that Jesus taught on righteousness by faith was a man without the wedding garment. In what chapter? Where is the, the, um, um, the vine and the branch found? What, where is it found? Everybody say John 15. And the man without the wedding garment, where is that found? Matthew 22. Where is it found? Matthew 22. And notice, that story, it starts out that the kingdom of heaven, that means the church, is likened to a certain king which made a what? Marriage for the son. Marriage for the son. In, or if you want to have that robe on, you've got to turn your mind to the marriage in heaven. Mm-hmm. The church don't even talk about the marriage in heaven. You don't hardly ever hear about it. But these people were invited to a wedding. And the people that were invited, what did we find out about them? <laughs> the same thing today. Adventists, a lot of them don't even want to hear about this subject. They want to hear about everything else. It's like they don't want to come. They don't want to hear about the wedding. But this was the, this was the lesson that he was trying to teach. Oops. Hope I didn't put it on there. 
You have to turn your mind, I posted it right here, to the wedding. If you want the wedding garment, we have to spend some time thinking about what Jesus is doing to marry his bride. In heaven, those 12 stones on the high priest's chest, that's his bride. And he's uniting with them. He's trying to perfect them right now. We know that the people wouldn't come, and so where were the servants sent? We've got to get out in the highways. We've got to start going next door and get in our communities and stop hovering over the avenues that don't want that. It's okay. We've got to get out in the highways. And eventually, the, the wedding was supplied with guests. But the king came in and found that man that did not have on the wedding garment. And when confronted, what was his response? Speechless. In the end, brothers and sisters, there's going to be no acceptable excuse for not having it on. We won't be able to blame the pastors, the SAP school, that's no one else, our husband, our wife, our children, our, our financial setbacks. There'll be no excuse. God says, I gave you every opportunity and you need to get that garment on. We know that in the end, that person was bound and okay. carried out. And Jesus closed by saying, many are called, but few are chosen. The chosen are the ones that respond. Everybody, the message goes, but only a few will respond. The third powerful parable that he taught for those that want to be clothed in his righteousness is the parable of the ten virgins. Where is that found? Matthew what chapter? So where is the vine and the branch found? And the man without the wedding garment? And the ten virgin parable? Matthew 25. And those three chapters, are, if we would study them, they would give us some, some important keys. We know the story. That, the, that they all slumbered and slept, they all had lamps, they all had oil, but the wise virgins had what? Oil. Extra oil. oil. And when the bridegroom tarried, um, the lamps burned dim, and then when he arrived, the lamps of the foolish had burned out. They said, give us of your oil. And they said, not so, lest we not have enough. Go to him that buy. And the whole purpose of this parable is that in that crisis time, we must have what? Extra oil. We have to have extra oil. Amen. That's, saying, that, that's God's way of saying more oil than you think. Mm -hmm. More oil than you have. Mm -hmm. You don't have enough of my spirit for the crisis that's coming. And so we have to learn, well, what do you have to do? The Bible says the Holy Spirit is given to them that obey, Acts 5.32. We have to start praying for that fruit. Lord, every day give me love, joy, peace, long suffering. There's, there's some things that we have to do in order for us to have John, this extra oil. Yes, I sister. Have a question. Uh, I was reading the great controversy, the chapter Holy of Holies, that the marriage is taking place now. Yes, it is. Okay. And it's going on in heaven. This it is began in 1844. It's going on in heaven now. But it says that he will receive his kingdom at the close of his ministration. That same chapter says, the marriage is going on, but he actually receives the kingdom. At the very end, he will receive it. He, you know what? Jesus can't marry someone that's all defective. He has to clean them up. Right. He's trying to clean up the bride so he can take her. And so he's looking for those that are going to cooperate and say, Lord, come in, do whatever needs to be done. This is Christologic lessons on this parable. This is profound. This is the climax of our whole talk. Says the class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They, they're attacking to the truth, but they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. They have not fallen upon the rock, Christ the gate. They have not permitted their old nature to be broken up. They're content with the what? Superficial word. Superficial word. They do not know God. They have not, what does it say? Steady is character. They have not held. And at that time, they go and they say, give us some of your oil. But it says, character is not wise. Right. See, it's the Holy Spirit that kind of puts the character of God in the wise virgins. So when the foolish virgins come, give us some of your oil. They're like, listen, what, what we have, we, we can't give that to you. You have to go to the people that sell it. Don't have time, but I'm going to say this. When they went, they were told, go buy for yourselves. And it says they went to buy. Let me tell you something. In the last days, the people that, that, that drag their feet, they're going to go to get some spirit. And they're going to get some spirit. But it's not going to be. Because these people, they came back. 
But the Bible says, when by the time they came back, the door was shut. We can be the foolish virgins if we drag our feet, if we do a superficial work. Jesus, so uh, fast forwarding our story, Jesus taught the principles of righteousness by faith. I believe that Jesus wore white clothes as a symbol of this righteousness. Why do I say that? Because in Mark chapter 9, when he was transfigured, the Bible says that his raiment became shining. Exceeding what color? White as snow. So as no fuller on earth can wipe it. He said, let me just show you how I dressed in heaven. Mm -hmm. He just let that, he let his garments just shine like the, brighter than the sun. They they were like, well, we've never seen anything like this before. And that those white garments that he wore every day, and on this particular day, they shone really bright, were a symbol of the white garment that we should be craving, we should be desiring that his parables are teaching us how to get. When he left and ascended up to heaven, who came down? It's about to speak to the disciples. Who came Elijah. down? Who came down? There were who appeared when he was ascended? Two angels. Two angels. Is that correct? Am I? No, at transfiguration he was there. When he yeah, when he ascended, yeah, at his transfiguration it was Elijah. But let me back up the picture again. When he ascended, who came down to speak? Two angels. Is that right? It says, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them. How were they dressed? In white garments. What did they wear in heaven? White. They, they were in black garments, like the lady said. Mm-hmm. This, is how they, this is how they roll. They roll in white. And they came and they said, listen, the same Jesus that you guys are looking for, he's coming again. And the, the disciples remember, they said, man, these, these, these brethren were dressed in white. And it was the same thing that Jesus wore. He dressed white, but the, uh, he was trying. He went up to heaven, and he began that work of trying to prepare his church to wear these wonderful white garments. This is the work that he's doing there. Uh, the uh, revelator said, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to ourselves. Is that what it said? Who's going to do it? Honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is coming. And his wife half, what does it say here? Jesus. She's done that work. And to her it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. What are those three words there? Clean. The margin for white says, right. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Our high priest now is, is getting the pillars in his temple. He said, I'm putting some white garment on them. I'm taking away what they have that's not uh, of me, and I'm putting them in that white ring. Now, Satan saw that when Christ went to heaven. He said, well, I've got to, I've got to war now. I've got to step fast because... He's, he's taught them how to have this white raiment, and I need to come into the church. And Christ went to heaven. We know that he, in the holy place, he, he was working among the seven candlesticks, which represent the seven churches. And we know that Ephesus was what kind of a church? What kind of church was Ephesus? It's a pure uh, church. In Smyrna, what happened to that church? Anybody remember? I'm going to give you guys the answers. Okay. Okay. Ephesus was the what church? Persecuted. The Ephesus. Pure then Smyrna was the what? Persecuted. Then Pergamus was the what? Pagan. You guys want to read? You guys don't have to read. Pagan. Pagan. Thyatira was the what? Read that. Pagan. Sardis was the what? Pagan. So the first five are all P's. Pure. Persecuted. Pagan. Papal. Sardis was the Protestant church. By the way, if you read the message to Sardis, it says, I have someone against you. You know, we didn't think of a Protestant movement like it was perfect. It was not perfect. It was flawed. But it was God working through them. And they had some light, but they didn't have all the light. So he had to bring a sixth church, Philadelphia, which is who? Ephesus. Let me start again. You ready? (laughs) Ephesus is who? Smyrna is who? Pergamus is who? Pagan. Thyatira is who? Pagan. Sardis is who? Philadelphia is who? Pagan. And then, in the last generation, there's going to be four churches side by side that are going to play different roles. You're going to see Papists, Protestants, Adventists, and a whole lot of lukewarm people all at the same time. In the book, by Keller Bunch, on the seven places of the churches, he says there's four churches side by side in the last day. They, had, they ruled the world at one time. They, they were no longer the church of the world. They, Protestants, everyone knew who Martin Luther was. Adventist, 1840, everybody knew what Adventists were. Now they, they're not leading the world anymore, but they're all still here. 
And they're all going to have a little interaction in the last days. And where are we now? Laodicea, which is who? It's who? Laodicea? <laughs> That's the Advent Church. <laughs> what Satan's plan was during Smyrna. Watch this real quick. Here's a little lesson on seven churches. His plan to destroy the church, originally they were pure. He said, let's just kill them all. But that plan didn't work very well. It worked a little bit. But there was something about these people that the more you kill them, it inspired other people to say, I saw that man die with courage. He was only 16 years old. And he looked the priest in the face and said, take my life. I'm ready to go. So whatever he had, I want that. And you would kill one, it would make five more. And so they had enough, they changed the plan. They said, we've got to get error amongst the church to compromise the truth because this Bible that they have has turned them into something that we can't fight against. And then under the Thyatira, they said, those that won't compromise will do what? So they were compromising error and killing, by the way. That's what's going to, these three things is what's going to come to bear on Laodicea and Philadelphia. That they're going to be trying to bring in error in our church. And then those that won't Go for the error, they're going to rise against you and rebuke you. Tell you you're a troublemaker in that church. And they put you out of the church and they'll, they'll start to harass. And it's going to lead ultimately to fines and ultimately to death. To death. We know that, that they used to light torches by the bodies of those Christians. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you, in that day, there were no hypocritical Christians. You wouldn't even join them mm-hmm. unless you believed it. Yeah. Because the price was a little bit too steep. Life. You know, you're going to lose your life. So it, it purifies it will happen again. That when the trouble really comes, most Adventists, they'll be gone. And it'll just be few people that will say, I believe the Sabbath and the Sunday is from the papacy from the Antichrist. And I'm not going with it. I will never bow my knee to Sunday. They'll say, what? We have to take you out. Great Congress says, what's the first two words? Vain. Vain were Satan's efforts to destroy the church of Christ by violence. By defeat, they conquered what happened to the work? It did what? It moved how? The gospel continued to what? Spread. And the number of inherits did what? Increase. So Satan said, and what was happening is that when they were dying, the, the living example of a dying testimony, it says subjects of Satan were leaving his service. People were just converting. The persecutors were getting converted. And so what did he do? He changed his plans. <laughs> he laid his plans to war more successfully. He brought his banner where? His persecution ceased. And then the messages that were taught, he brought in all these pagan ideas about worship the mother with the son and all these ideas. But when they preached about Jesus, there was no conviction of sin, no need of repentance. They brought in the pagan idea, just come in as you are. We accept you as you are. Just come in. And, and that Christian should make what? Don't let anybody tell you in the church that we have to make concessions. We do not have to make concessions. As I heard Christopher Hudson preach, he says, when you, go in the Bible, when you go into the club, you don't bring your Bible out and start reading. You know why? You don't do that in the club. So, but they don't make any apologies for that. At the club, they dance and swear and do crazy things. So at the church, we should make no apologies for preaching the Bible. Because no. we don't do the things of the club. We do, we're in a church. So we have to do what a church does and without making apologies. So there won't be any concessions. But they brought in these pagan ideas and it says, now the church was in what? Fearful peril. Prison, torture, fire, and sword were blessings in comparison. They brought in all these pagan ideas. Hey, when you get communion, you're getting something from the sun. You're getting some grace coming into you. It it, it says that under a cloak of what? Pretending. Pretending Christianity. Satan was insinuating himself into the church. The whole effect was that the standards were lowered and uh, there was a union form between Christianity and pagan. That's what our church is today. There's paganism in the way that churches run. People, they don't even understand. Oh, we're having an Easter Sabbath service. What? There is no such thing as Easter Sabbath. Ishtar is of paganism. And the doctrines that came in in the early centuries were doctrines that warred against righteous living. The pagans said wrote prayers over and over. And now the Catholics began to say memorize prayers. Instead of heartfelt prayers that adapt to the temptations, 
<laughs> and then the big surge came when this man, whose name was Constantine the Great, came on the scene. You know that they say that his conversion took place. They have to know the day that it took place in 312 AD. He was in a big battle at the Mildian Bridge. And just the day before the battle, the history books say that he looked up in the sky and he saw a cross. And he saw words in the sky that said, in this sign, conquer. And he said, ah, I will become a Christian. One history book says that he caused his army to march through the river. That's how they were baptized. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, there's people today that they just go through the water, but they really, there's no change that's taking place. And he had the, Christ, the soldiers put crosses on their spears and on their shields, and they went into this battle, and guess what? They won. And he became the emperor of Rome. And um, it says, I kind of skip some of this, this nominal conversion of Constantine in the early part of the fourth century, that's 312, caused great rejoicing, and the world, cloaked with the form of righteousness, did what? Walked into it. It walked into the church. <laughs> Now the work of corruption rapidly progressed. It says that paganism, instead of being vanquished, it became the conqueror. Paganism's spirit and her doctrines um, came into the church. And that compromise resulted in the development of who? Yes. Now you know the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7, that the mystery of iniquity doth already work. In the first century, the mystery of iniquity was already working before there was the papacy. Paganism was already coming in when the New Testament was written. What is the mystery of godliness? Anybody know? Colossians 1.27. What is the mystery of godliness? Christ in you. The hope of glory. You know what the mystery of iniquity is? Satan in you. No hope of glory. It was already coming in. And this developed into something called what? What does that say there? Who is that talking about? You, you history students? Who is the man of sin? It is the papacy. That's the fourth church dietary. Why was the Catholic Church called the man of sin? Here it is, 2 Thessalonians 2 3. Let me give you the answer right here. It's because the doctrines of Rome do what? They promote sin. We'll, we'll come to you in just a moment. <laughs> Let's touch on some of those doctrines real quickly. You know that the Catholic Church teaches that you have big sins and little sins. They call it mortal and venial sins. And that when you commit a venial sin, it's a less... This is from Catholic doctrines. If you look it up on the screen, it's a less serious... Sin. Let me say something, brothers and sisters. All sins are serious. Amen. There's, the Bible says there's a sin that's not under death. By the way, the sin that's not under death is the repented of sin, Okay? Any little sin that you stay in is under death. It's a misinterpretation. But they teach that, that when you're born, you're just full of sin. God's grace is empty, not in your heart. But when you're baptized, the baptism fills the soul with the milk of God's grace. And they baptize children. This is error, okay? Nothing, no grace of God fills the soul of some little baby that you're sprinkling water on. That's what they're teaching. But they teach that after that, that when you commit venial or little sins, you have God's grace, but not perfectly. There are spots in your milk. It's only when you commit a mortal sin that you're, you have none of God's grace. Brothers and sisters, when you commit a little sin, you've lost all of God's grace. Let me tell you, okay? There's no such thing as you can commit a little sin and God is still in you and working and His Spirit is... Dry. No, Jesus don't give His Spirit to do sins. He only gives His Spirit to... So their doctrine, here's an actual picture of it, this is what they teach. This is the person that's in God's grace and committed a venial sin, and the angels just say, I'm going to watch over him. Look at his face. Yeah. That's an evil in him, but he's okay still. It's not until he commits a mortal sin that he is, and, 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 and Catholics believe this. And know what that does? It encourages them to commit little sins. And the devil has them, and they lose the robe of Christ's righteousness. Another one of the doctrines that causes... Why it was called the man of sin is because of auricular means hear, heard or in the ear confession. 
I don't even have to comment on this. This is an actual picture of what they believe, that Christ is standing behind the priest and mm. that his grace and forgiveness is coming through the priest. Mm. Great controversy says, the church's claim to the right to pardon leads the Roman Catholic to feel what? At liberty to sin. It says that confession, without which pardon is not granted, tends to give what? Nice. That whole thing, it can, people say, you know what? All I got to do is just go down to the priest and then... It's all taken care of. So I can just do a little bit of this and I just show up at the priest at 10 o'clock at night. I'm great. I'm cool. I'm straight. And it actually it increases sin. Let me tell you something else that's devious about it. A little money in the box helps. And, and some money, yeah. You get to <laughs> take care of daddy's sins and mama's sins too. <laughs> the spirit of prophecy is clear that, that any person, when a man con or a woman confesses to another man, it says the person is defiled in consequence. Mm -hmm. It says that this degrading confession of man to man is the secret spring from which has flowed much of the evil defiling the whole world. Let me tell you something else that how, why God called him the man of sin. This is what they show. To go up to the confession, you can do all of these things. You don't even have to repent. Mm -hmm. Repentance is not one of the steps. That's the thing that the Bible teaches in order for your sins to be forgiven. That's the hard part. You've got to turn. You gotta say, Lord, put your grace and help me to turn from this thing. This man here, Charles Tenequi, who was famous for a book called Fifty Years in the Church of Rome. You never read that. That's a thriller you won't be able to put down. <laughs> this man, he was a starch Catholic priest, and step by step, God woke him up. Amen. And he battled, and he tells this story of how he woke up and that God spoke to him, and he eventually he left. The Catholic Church. He wrote a book called The Priest, The Woman, and the Confessional. Yeah. The book is profound. In that book, he says this. He says it's one of Satan's most diabolical plans. He says, by beholding, we become what? Change. And he says, Satan's plan is that the minister of the church, the priest, all the sins of the congregation yeah. pour into his yeah. mind, and he becomes so dark and so corrupted that he leads the church into darkness and corruption. He says it's a, it's a plot of devils. In this book, he explains how the confessional, it's, it's created by Satan to corrupt and to pollute. Well, wasn't That's why this, Wasn't this all part of what the whole Protestant Reformation was about? And Luke, and Luke, to, that's what it was all... To clean this up. To clean this up. That's, that's right. That's whole, right. That's we, we're we're coming there. We can, we can like, speed along. There's other yeah. doctrines of the, of the Catholic Church that actually increase sin. They teach that there's a whole pantheon of saints that can interpret your prayers to God. They teach that Mary is the co-redemptress and that she can actually, um, um, that the grace of God comes through the hands of Mary. This is out of the St. Baltimore Catechism. And it's all a lie. We should not even be, Mary's probably in the grave. Unless she was at the, because at the special resurrection, she was still alive. Isn't that correct? Yes. At the cross, she was at the cross. Yeah. So we know that she didn't come up, in the, she's in the grave. So she's not in heaven and, and people that are looking to her, they're missing out on the one great mediator and they're continuing in their sin. This is, what are we saying? This is why Paul calls this organization the man of sin because a billion people are kept in darkness. Yeah. And that's why God brought... She's the mother of God. They also teach Sunday keeping, which is yeah. sin. That's correct. They say we've changed it in honor of Christ's resurrection and causing people to break one of his commandments and whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, what? He's what? He's guilty of all. In the 14th century, in the 1300s, God began to raise up men. And the man that was the morning star of the Reformation was John Wycliffe. And um, Wycliffe, he studied, he was a man of brilliant um, uh, intellect, in a, um, a spotless character. And he began to study, it says here in Great Controversy, the plan of salvation. And he began to preach against everything that the Catholic Church was doing wrong. And they were afraid of him. His voice had power to convict and to change. And he, he was like a lightning bolt out of a clear sky. They did not see him coming. God raised him up. And, and when he was not yet 60 years old, in his 50s, he got very ill. And they thought he was going to die. And the priest came to his bed trying to get him to recant just before he died. And he had the people sit him up on the bed. And he said, in his strong voice that had caused me to come he said, I shall not die but live. And again declare the evil deeds of you people. 
<laughs> it says, astonished and abandoned, they hurried from the room. And, and, and he rose from his deathbed and he translated the Bible into English for the first time in the history of the world. He gave it to the English speaking people. And that accomplishment put a blow on Rome. If we would read and believe our Bibles, all of these things would fall off. He was famous also for training ministers to go out. They were called the Lollards. He trained men to go out and to teach the Bible. And it shook the foundations of Catholicism 200 years before Luther. Yes? That's correct. That's correct. That's the only way. They couldn't get the pulpits. The priests controlled it. So they went. That's what we're doing here. We should, right here, we should be at the church right now. We should be at Hammond or Northwest or, or someplace else and have the pulpit. But we don't have it. So we're here. And that's what they did. And um, that was the beginning of God teaching again how these people could have the righteousness of Christ. We know that Luther came 200 years later in the early 1500s. And um, he had, these men had a courage that we don't see often. Everything in the world was against them. They didn't care. They threw caution to the wind. And they hurled with tremendous power and force um, true crystal clear arguments against the false teachings of their time. I don't know if you've ever looked at the 95 Theses, but actually you can get them on, online, all translated into English. And um, these theses, uh, Luther attacked almost all of the teachings of Rome, but um, he um, taught that Christians should be exhorted to seek earnestly to follow who? Christ. Not the priest, but Christ in their head. He taught things. He said the priest, the Pope doesn't have any power to remit penalties. He, he struck blows at the very foundation of their power. He said, listen, righteousness is in Christ alone. You've got to go to him directly. And the church rose up and they said, we will kill you and everyone that follows. He said, come on. And when they brought him, they sent an interdict to bring him in to the, to the diet. That His friends said, don't go. He went. And the church thought that he was going to actually bow down to their thing. And he stood up and his words were so powerful. It says the people were paralyzed. He spun around and walked out, and the soldiers didn't even move when he walked out of there. We did in great controversy. God is going to raise up men and women like that in our day who will know the Bible, who will stand true, that there's nothing in them where they're holding on to some sin, and they'll be able to do a mighty work. And this robe of righteousness, we'll get it again. We know that during the Dark Ages that they actually... That, they, that the fires of the Inquisition burned, that they, they created tortures to bring people as much suffering as possible to try to get them to repent. We know that, that, the, um, that, that the Protestants started out good, but they never renounced all of their papal errors. They retained some of those errors. One of the errors, and if you were to Google the image of, quote, Robo Christ righteousness, you'll find many pictures like this. What's the problem with this picture? Covering, they are, it says in Zechariah 3, it says, take away the filthy garments and clothe them in a change of raiment. That's God's plan. What does that mean in practical terms? It means that you pray and say, Lord, take away my pride, take away my dishonesty, take away my, my wandering mind. You ask him to take away these things and you say, Lord, give me humility, give me purity of thought. You ask him to put on those traits you live your life in me, and you actually ask him to remove this, not to put this over your sin. You have to tell him that sin is sin, and that we have to get rid of sin if we want to be in heaven. But the Protestants, they kept some of those errors, so much so that by the 1840s, inspiration says that the daughters of Babylon, which symbolizes the churches that do what? Claim to her doctrines. That they, that this power here says was the various churches professing the what? In the 1800s the Protestants had become Babylon. They was, it was Rome at first but now her daughters following her in the 1800s God could not work through the Lutheran church anymore. He could not work through the Methodist church. Charles Wesley and these men they were doing, John Wesley they were doing the right thing but when their followers turned from the Bible 
they went into darkness, and the Protestant churches, Sardis, became dark. And so God raised up another movement. What movement was that? Second Advent movement. That's a, and who's that? Us. Everybody say us. us. Us by God's grace. Say us by God's grace. Us. us by God's grace. He raised up a new movement. In 1833, he called the star, caused the stars to fall. He's, this is like the 10 years before. It's like, you know, the Feast of Trumpets, it was 10 days ago, the devil told me, he was like, I gotta wake up the world, something important's about to happen. And he brought a new movement on the scene. He caused a man named Hiram Edson that was walking across the field. This is, this is October 23rd, and they waited till midnight, and they were in the barn, and they were crying. And they said, oh, yes. didn't happen. Let's go encourage our brethren. They went through the coin field. They said, I don't want people to see us. The corn was still on the stock because they, they didn't harvest it. They said, we're going home. They didn't go home. And they prayed in that barn. They said, we want you to reveal to us what went wrong. And while they were walking, I've read several accounts. It's, it's as the heavens opened before his mind. And his companions traveled on. They looked back and they said, Hiram, why are you so far back? He said, God is answering our prayer in the barn. And he, God revealed to him, you know that when Jesus began his work in the holy place, there was a man that looked steadfastly into heaven. And he said, I see one son standing as a son of man. Who was that? Who was being stoned? Philip, Stephen. His name was Stephen. And God opened before his eyes. What the, It happened again in 1844. One man, God opened the heaven. He saw what he was doing. And this began the study of the sanctuary message in our church. Another message that's been buried, like righteousness by faith. We know that these early pioneers had an experience that we today do not have. They dedicated everything. James White harvested a field, I think it was like seven acres, by hand. You don't know how much work that is. It took him weeks to do it. He broke his health to get a little bit of money to print a magazine because he believed that that magazine had light that was needed at his time and the dedication was unbelievable. And these people, with William Miller leading the way and serving the Lord, confirming which path was right, began a mighty movement to teach the last climatic teachings of righteousness by faith. Our light is coming through our... We know that the third angel's message which was preached from them pointed the people to where the um, marriage is taking place. Two men in particular, 40 years later, um, God raised them up as erroneous ideas concerning righteousness by faith came in. As people began to put too much emphasis on external works, God raised the two men. Their names were Ellet Wagner and Alonzo T. Jones. And they preached um, in 1888 a message. And here it is in just two paragraphs. We're at the end. The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world what? Lifted Savior. It presented what? Yes, By, through faith and the surety, it invited the people to receive what? The righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to how many? All. Oh. The Lord actually sends here. It says, many had lost sight of Jesus. That's the problem in Adventism. There's not enough preaching on Jesus. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They need to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men. But look at this word here. And parting the priceless gift of what? To the helpless human agent. Watch this. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. What message? That he imparts his own right. He, he not imputes it. He's going to impart it to you. You can have it. You can live it out. It says, this is the message that God commanded to give to the world. It is the what? Third angel. The angel. third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice. And that turned with the outpouring of the Spirit in a large measure. <coughs> so this is the message that we are given to give to the world. Wagner and Jones were persecuted when they came to teach it. I have the 1888 message committee's uh, booklets, and in one meeting, they were called before the, the council, and when they gave the time for them to speak, they stood up and they read 
50 Bible texts without any commentary. One would read one text, the other would sit down, the other would read one text, one would sit down, and they read 25 texts each, and they said, the end of the meeting, amen, let's pray. God was speaking. They said, if you're going to criticize, you're going to criticize the Bible, mm. and not us. And the men were weeping and gnashing their, their teeth. And they taught this message how we can receive his right. It was our last day. The Bible says, him that overcomes, the same shall be clothed in what? And God will confess him. We know that the Advent has started out good. But later on, they too compromised their position. In the 1950s, Adventists began to meet secretly with the evangelicals, the Sunday-keeping Christians. And they said, we will want to be accepted by you. And Donald Barnhouse, who was a big Sunday pastor, he was the editor of Turning Magazine, um, he met with T.E. Unruh and um, Reed, W.E. Reed, and they began a dialoguing. Um, Barnhouse, and this was his partner, Walter Martin, who wrote Kingdom of the Cults. And the Adventists began to strenuously say, well, we don't believe that. And they said, wait a minute. They said, go to the ABC, bring that book. They said, here it is in your book. He said, we will remove those books. We want to be accepted by you. And um, they actually, after, the, after a long period of time of them talking, they sent out a book that explained the position. It was sent out to Sunday pastors. It was called Questions on Doctrines. And it was a new position. And there were Adventists who began to approach and say, why are you meeting with these people? And, why? and it's because of the fruit of these meetings is that today it's hard to find the true Advent message. Here come to the close of our program. Do you want to have that robe of righteousness as badly as this lady wanted it, where she pressed through the cloud and said, nothing will keep me from getting hold to that garment. She got hold to it. And all the virtue of Christ came in. You know, there's, there's Christians that actually pray with, that teach with no clothes on. You know that? I have to get that off the screen. There's actually preachers who preach naked. I have to take that off the screen. But not literally preach naked. But, but spiritually, there's many today who are naked. There are pastors fully dressed in nice clothes, but they don't have on the garment of the spikes. Why? Because they're drinking the wine. Of the false doctrine. They're drinking the teachings of this man that's coming. That, that says that grace comes through the seven sacraments. There's, there's Protestants now who believe that foolishness. There's, they listen to these people, these televangelists who are preaching foolishness. T.D. Jakes and all of these people, Joel Osteen, and they watch, um, uh, um, I'm not going to call any more names. Uh, uh, Creflo Dollar on these people and their false prophets, brothers and sisters, Adventists, yeah. tune into them and watch them like the Adventists did. Did you see that? I say, no, I didn't see that. I don't watch him. <laughs> they don't have any light to teach us anything. People are thinking that <laughs> Obama was going to solve the problem. His program is about to get torn down. <laughs> we thought it was going to be the, the mistress of lies to get in, but look what happened in the end. Make America great again. We don't know what's going to come so now is the time for us to get on the robe of Christ's righteousness. We don't want to be those virgins who we won't yield to the Holy Spirit's work, and we will not allow our nature to be broken up. We're not studying. If we're not studying the character of Christ, we're, we're following in the steps of the foolish virgins. We here are following in those steps. We've got to make a change. As I said, they went and got oil. You know where they're going to get their oil from? They're getting it in the charismatic movement. You heard of Azusa Street Revival? Yep. In 1906, in a church in Los Angeles, on a street called Azusa Street, they, they started the modern tongue speaking movement. And that is now sweeping through every denomination. They taught faith healing and that they could speak in this unknown tongues. And it's coming through this false doctrine that God can clothe his Put his grove of righteousness over your sinful life. The Bible says to take away the filthy garments and clothe them in a change of raiment. How many of you want to study this subject more and understand it better and live it out more? Amen. That's your desire. Let's close out in prayer. Father in heaven, we've been sitting for a long time. We, we see that there's, from the very beginning, 
when Adam and Eve lost their garments of light, that you came in, took away their fig leaves, and gave them a complete covering. Well, we want to have that covering, and we confess that we haven't studied it like we should, and we haven't allowed you to break up our old natures like we should. And we pray that you will just continue to speak to us, work with us. Don't give up on us yet, Lord. If you would give us more grace, more humility, more willingness to be taught. Help us to pray more and talk less and seek you that we might be changed and we might be those people that explain to the world how they too can have this white rain. Bless us as we break for our meal and help our words to be encouraging and Sabbath-observing words, we pray in Jesus' mighty name and all the people said together. Amen. Amen. Amen.